Hi, I'm Jay Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader, and I'm here to talk with you about another episode of the 1950s television anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written for magazines like Starlog, Film Facts, and Midnight Marquee, and the Reader published my in-depth history of this program a while back. Uh, this episode of Tales of Tomorrow, The Window, was broadcast live as it was performed on November 7th, 1952 on an ABC Network soundstage. It was on East 66th Street in New York City, and we're actually about to see the inside of that studio in this episode. Uh, it's not really called The Lost Planet. The title card here is just kind of a fake-out uh, to prepare you for the real story. When the producers of this DVD asked me to, uh, which episodes I was most interested in doing commentaries for, this is actually the first title I wrote down. Not just a great science fiction story, it's a terrific example of what can be done in the anthology format. I also consider it among one of the best episodes of any TV show that, that ever aired on television. Certainly one of the first to break the so-called fourth wall, separating the performers from the viewers. The story that we're watching was made specifically for television, could only have been realized on television, and it was inspired by and could only exist on what was then a brand new medium of, uh, of entertainment. Uh, the producer of the show uh, who came up with this is Tales, uh, Tales of Tomorrow, uh, was co-created, I should say, by Mort Abrahams. Uh, he got a start in uh, TV producing shows like Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, uh, and he later went on to do uh, shows like Route 66, The Man from U.N.C.L.E., and films like Dr. Doolittle, Goodbye uh, Mr. Chips, uh, and the first two Planet of the Apes films. Well, I, I interviewed him... Uh, in the late 80s, and we're going to quote him in a minute here. What, what we're watching here is the announcer uh, came on and told us at the beginning, after a commercial for Chrysler watch bands that we didn't get to see here, uh, the viewers are expecting this episode, The Lost Planet, to start up. Uh, they have no idea that the window is a sort of a, uh, a twist on the Orson Welles War within a or, or War of the World story within a story kind of broadcast. Uh, it, it introduces those fake credits, and it seems at first like it's going to be a typical doomsday thriller. And, and then it cuts away to this strange signal that interrupts the broadcast with a different image flickering into view on the screens. And it's as if this camera is pointed directly at this residential window somewhere in the city. And we see these people talking uh, and drinking. There's lots of drinking going on, and we hear them too. And what we see in here is an increasingly alarming conversation about someone who's going to be murdered, one of these people here. Uh, the signal that keeps going in and out over the course of the episode, we go back and forth from this uh, intended episode, The Lost Planet, to uh, what, what appears to be something happening maybe somewhere in the city as the broadcast is going on, these people in this window talking. And uh, I'll read you one of the quotes here from uh, Mort Abrahams, who describes kind of how this happened. Uh, it was written by a fellow named Frank DeFolita, and it was based on a bet that was made between the two of them. Uh, Mort Abrahams told me, quote, he and I had a bet. We used to challenge each other. Fortunately, in those days, you could do that. You work 20 hours, but you laugh a little. I made a bet with him. I challenged him to write something that would only be done on television, that could not be done in theater, could not be done on film, and the only medium that could be done is live television. And I bet him a dinner. He went home to think about it. He called me a couple of days later to say, I think you owe me a dinner. And I said, not until you tell me what it's all about. Well, he came in and explained it to me, and I just thought it was a, a great idea. And what we're seeing right here is this is the actual uh, ABC studio. We can hear, uh, although we can't hear as we do this DVD commentary, Don Medford's voice. Uh, and they're all kind of panicking, trying to figure out where this signal's been coming from, how it could possibly have interrupted their broadcast. Uh, and uh, then we cut back to this mysterious view of, the, uh, of what's happening through this window. Now, I want to point out how bleak the apartment behind the window looks. It's, it seems like it's the kind of place where unhappy people are sweating and drinking in a hot summer night. And it may have just been a case of not having any money to dress the set, but uh, it makes the juxtaposition even more noticeable, I feel like, between the, this hopeless-looking little apartment and then the, the modern TV studio full of bright, shiny, and, and futuristic equipment and gainfully employed people running around wearing suits and presumably not planning on murdering anybody. Uh, this is Rod Steiger is over on the right. He's our lead player. He's one of his earliest TV appearances. He was in one other Tales of Tomorrow, an episode called The Evil Within. That one featured a young James Dean. We, we talked about him a bit in that commentary. Uh, the Evil Within aired right around the same time that Steiger did an episode of a science fiction show called Out There. And, of course, he'd go on to be known for movies like In the Heat of the Night, Waterloo, Pawn Broker, On the Waterfront, uh, The Harder They Fall, and, and uh, Dr. Zhivago. 
Uh, we cut back to the studio here, and uh, what we've got is now uh, this fellow's being introduced as kind of a uh, technician who's going to explain to us uh, the mysterious window signal is probably showing something happening right there in the studio. And we're seeing, according to this guy, he's going to tell us that there's sort of an ionized uh, broadcast reflection, maybe bouncing off a building or a cloud. And uh, there's actually, you know, there's a bit of science behind that. There's, there's a true story that turned up a lot in those old Believe It or Not books, uh, Stranger Than Science and Strangely Enough, those kind of books. Uh, the story goes that it was sometime in the early 1950s and people in England were supposedly watching their TV sets when uh, suddenly the, the screens showed the call letters of, and test pattern of KLEE TV, which was a station in Houston, Texas. And, and that image stayed on these British TV screens for several moments. At least one person took some photos of it. And, uh, but KLEE, it turned out, had gone off the air like three years earlier. And so the story, you know, leads you to wonder where the signal had been bouncing around for those three years. How did it then turn up on this British TV station? And, uh, well, the story turned out to be a hoax, that particular one. That happened around 1953. Uh, but it's possible that this episode's writer, Frank DeFolita, heard about that KLEE story. And uh, that might have uh, been something he came up with a twist on that for this lost signal for the window. I mean, the notion is not uh, entirely impossible. Uh, is certainly, they, they talk also in the explanation about how electrical signals uh, have been known to bounce and stay intact. And uh, so it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. There is some science in this science fiction. Uh, the writer who thought this up uh, on a bet, Frank DeFolitti, he scripted around a dozen episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. He'd later be known for his novels Audrey Rose, which came out in 1975, uh, and The Entity from 1978. And both of which, uh, both of those he adapted into successful films. He got to start scripting for the weekly radio show The Whistler before taking jobs writing for TV shows like Your Jewelers Showcase, uh, The Plymouth Playhouse, Suspense, Armstrong Circle Theater, uh, Medallion Theater, uh, which is also known as General Electric Theater. And on that show, he worked with uh, Tales of Tomorrow's producer Mort Abrahams. Uh, he also wrote for uh, Campbell's Summer Soundstage, which like Tales of Tomorrow, had a young James Dean in an episode. And uh, Frank DeFolita eventually became in demand as a real genuine triple threat. He was a writer, a producer, and a director. Uh, he went on to write for noted anthologies like Studio One. Uh, he got Emmy nods in 1963 and 1968 for his documentaries. Uh, and he won a Peabody Award and, and several Writers Guild Awards. So Back here in the uh, apartment, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of our performers here. Rob Steiger... Uh, is uh, accompanied, or was, up until a moment ago, by Frank Maxwell. He was the other mean drunk. And uh, Frank was in TV anthologies like Hands of Mystery, Lux Video Theater, One Step Beyond. Uh, he's in the 1960 Twilight Zone episode, A World of Difference. Uh, he's in an Outer Limits episode called The Man with the Power. Uh, he's in several episodes each of Perry uh, Mason. He's in Alpha Hitchcock Presents, a few different ones. Also, he even turned up on the Munsters. He played uh, roles like he was a gym coach in one. He was a, a police desk sergeant in another. The, the wife was played by Virginia Vincent. She did one other episode of Tales of Tomorrow in 1953, episode called Another Chance. And she'd come up through the usual anthology TV shows like The Web and Studio One, Alfred Hitchcock Hour. She was in multiple episodes of 77 Sunset Strip and Dragnet and Perry Mason, Adam 12, The Untouchables. Uh, here we are back in the studio again. And uh, this is kind of interesting because the commercials still got worked into it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, they, they still managed to get in there and get the sponsor talking about it, although they do it in the context of the program. Then we cut back to here to uh, Virginia Vincent again with uh, Rod Steiger. Um, they, they've apparently... <laughs> well, we, I, I presume that you've watched this episode before you listen to the commentary, so, uh, you know, I think you kind of know what's happening. I'll tell you a little bit about the director, Don Medford. Uh, he directed about 35 episodes of Tales of Tomorrow, uh, and since the show ran 85 episodes, that, that's quite a few. Uh, scripted around 100 TV shows, including five episodes of The Twilight Zone. He did Alfred Hitchcock Presents, did the final episode of The Fugitive, uh, he did nearly three dozen episodes of the FBI, a couple dozen Berettas, Dynasty, Mrs. Columbo, Airwolf. He even did the final episode of the 1980s television show, The Colbys. He also occasionally scripted and uh, produced the TV shows that he worked on. So, uh, Robert Lewine actually is, uh, 
we saw him briefly in the studio. He is somebody I interviewed also uh, back in the late 1980s, early 1990s about the show. And uh, he, he's the guy that we saw on camera insisting that the commercial go on. He also, uh, he went on to a pretty stellar career himself. This was one of his few on-camera appearances. It's kind of funny, actually. And I'll read you uh, some of the quotes here. He said, I was the ad agency man in the pinstripe suit. He yells, keep on going to commercial or something like that. All the extras seen on the set of the window were actual TV techs and employees other than actors. We had a camera anchored with no operator at the window, and it just stayed there the whole time. One static shot, unquote. And... Uh, you actually see him standing there saying, I don't care what happens, I want these commercials. And that's when we see the guy doing his little uh, shtick for the Chrysler watches there. And uh, that, now, now what's interesting is, according to Mort Abrahams, when the window was airing live, there, some viewers were indeed fooled into thinking that they were watching real events, that there was an actual signal interrupting the attempted Lost Planet broadcast here. And uh, Mort Abrams actually told me, I read a quote, he said, quote, the switchboard at ABC lit up despite our disclaimer. We had a disclaimer that it was not a true story, unquote. Now, I was really surprised to hear that because, uh, as we can see here, there, there, there was no disclaimer at the beginning. There's, there's no version of these kinescopes I've seen that has a disclaimer. Um, and Abrahams was surprised when I mentioned that to him, so I guess it's possible that the notice, uh, that disclaimer, wasn't even seen in some cities, especially judging from the subsequent actions and events that had long been rumored, uh, which both Abrahams and Lewin confirmed for me. Uh, Robert Lewin, he was on the set for every episode of Tales of Tomorrow, and he told me, this is a true story apparently, quote, the police came into the studio, the New York City police, wanted to know where the murder was going to take place. A lot of stations cut off the air in the middle of the show because they thought there was a real murder going to take place, unquote. Which seems almost unbelievable, but Mort Abrahams confirmed that this really happened. And I'll read you his quote also. He said, quote, We did get two policemen who came in after the broadcast ended and wanted to know what all the fuss was about. The switchboards were lighting up. They pulled it off the air in Cincinnati, and I thought they pulled it off the air in Boston as well because they believed a murder was about to take place. Now I think, if I remember correctly, uh, there was a real brouhaha about it the next week. Around eight or ten stations refused to carry the program, until it was all quieted down in the following week and everybody returned to the fold, unquote. So, so here they are, they're, they're back in the studio. And what they've done is they're trying to figure out exactly where the, uh, the, 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 this mysterious broadcast is breaking into the, uh, the lost planet from. And they've got it narrowed down to an address at this point. Uh, they figured out that the couple's probably going to push this third guy out a window at 40th Street and 8th Avenue. And they're, they're running over here and trying to figure out exactly, uh, you know, get the coordinates of exactly what's going to happen. And they want to call the cops. Uh, but then how are they going to explain how they got this information? <laughs> it's actually happening live on television. And, of course, by the time it cuts back to the, the window here, we see it looks like it's too late. It looks like Rod Steiger and uh, this lady here have already pushed the other guy out the window. Uh, and Rod Steiger is talking about how he wants to kind of go down and see if, uh, if this guy's dead. Uh, and he, here's actually where the, the episode kind of takes a real surreal note uh, in that, you know, he's trying to kind of talk her into uh, you know, getting, pulling herself together. Uh, they, they apparently just committed murder. But at this point, they, they, they break the, the fourth wall in yet another way because... She suddenly, as he's shaking her, she suddenly seems to get the feeling that there's somebody watching her. She tells him that. And, and she thinks that, as she's referring to the audience, basically. She's saying that, you know, that the audience out there, somehow or other, she senses that this signal uh, is going out and that people have seen their dastardly deed, that they actually plotted this thing. And uh, she, she probably thinks that they actually saw this guy go out the window. But it's really surreal in that, you know, she, 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 she literally looks... Uh, you know, out, out to the audience and says, you know, I have a feeling that someone's watching all this happening. And, uh, which in a way, you know, ended up sort of being the case. I mean, all these people in these different cities, if that's really true about Cincinnati and Boston, uh, and people are really calling the police, then there's a chance that the police were probably arriving at the ABC studio, the real police, uh, you know, not too long after the actor police, the fake police, had staged this scene about, well, how do you know this murder is going to go on? 
Uh, and then she kind of looks at the camera and kind of has seen people seeing this happening. Uh, so really quite surreal, quite a, uh, a thought-provoking uh, a thing on the course of, of Frank DeFolita to have thought of it that way. Uh, his later career was really pretty impressive, Frank DeFolita, and, and as was Don Menford, as was, uh, as was our, our producer here, uh, Mort Abrahams. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Frank Tafalud, actually, because when I interviewed him, he's a really interesting character. He, he's one of those writer's writers. And he later took a, a turn at directing. He directed the well-regarded 1981 TV movie called The Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, which is widely considered one of the best scarecrow horror movies ever filmed, as well as directing Paramount's 1991 Sharon Stone thriller Scissors. He also did the book and then the screenplay for The Entity, the 1978 horror novel and the 1982 film, although he didn't direct it. Sidney Fury directed that. Uh, and it was responsible for the reemergence of Barbara Hershey. And uh, I'm going to read you one of Frank DeFolita's quotes here. Uh, he talks about how he got started in the program. He says, quote, I thought that Tales of Tomorrow was the best of the live television shows at the time. I came onto the show later. I loved it. I used to watch it. And what was amazing to me was the ability of this program to deliver on live television the quality of an edited motion picture. At the time, I was interested in film, and television was simply a stepping stone to film to me, or at least that's what I wished it to be. It was soon after the advent of television, and everyone was playing with the medium like a toy. It was such fun, and yet it was crude. Everything that they did was crude. It was like playing with something that they weren't quite familiar with. And the nature of the pictures would come out, the finished product would always be, to me anyways, kind of corny. Not quite up to the power of a motion picture. It never did quite measure up to the quality and the fluidity that the perfection that only movies can give you. So live television was always, to me, a poor man's movie, he said. Uh, even though I made money and was able to support myself and my family, it always left a great sort of vacant spot in my wishes, my desires. I always felt this TV was not really what I wanted to do. Then one time I saw an episode of Tales of Tomorrow. It had been on, I guess, I just never saw it. And I was amazed at the fantastic quality of the show, at least compared to the ones I was working on. I immediately called my agent at the time and told him I wanted to write that program. And he said, no, it was impossible because they didn't take outside writers. They had a stable of writers. It was very difficult to get in, unquote. Well, Frank DeFolita didn't let his agent deter him for long. Uh, at the time, the, uh, a movie out called The Thing from Another World was in theaters, and uh, he wrote a story that was kind of similar to that, uh, that he called The Cocoon, uh, but an object from another world where there's an invisible creature, and uh, he felt sure that story would be perfect for Tales of Damar. And uh, I'll read you more of his quote here. He says, There was a man there named George Foley who apparently was the producer, but he was always in the background. So then I was trying to get to Mort Abraham's, he was the person who purchased these stories, and finally my agent managed to break me, for, sneak me in rather for an interview with him, unquote. And uh, he, he later on recalled his meeting with Mort Abrahams. Frank DeFolito said, quote, The interview consisted mainly of him telling me how tough it was to find writers who wrote the kind of material they were looking for, who could write it well. He had found four or five writers that he thought were terrific, and he was satisfied to give them all of the shows. I said, would you accept a script on spec? And he said, of course, if I have the time, I'll read it. I went home and wrote The Cocoon and got it to him, and he loved it. He said it would make a scary script, but it was awfully difficult to get him to buy it. Uh, and Frank DeFolita said, some time went by before someone else from the show finally called him to tell him that they were going to purchase that story. And that's a really good one. It actually, it was released under the name The Fury of the Cocoon. And that was also directed by the same director from this episode here, Don Medford. They were a very winning team, really, right from the start. Uh, and The Fear of the cocoon, cocoon is a good one. It's uh, about an African jungle uh, with explorers that are being terrorized by giant blood-sucking insects from outer space. They've gotten there via a meteorite, but you can't avoid them because they're invisible. They're, it's like, uh, like Predator, basically. Uh, and director Don Medford really builds up the suspense in that one. They, first, they find an ominous note from the previous doomed expedition, and then uh, as the frequency of the attacks build up, just real terrific work. Medford and DeFolita... Uh, and they started fantastically, you know, with stories like this, and they just got better and better and better together. Uh, really well suited for each other. Uh, Don Medford also directed another jungle-based story that Frank DeFolita wrote. It was called The Fatal Flower. That one's about two botanists who develop a man-eating plant uh, that they, they each basically have different, different plans for. 
Uh, Frank de Felitta never wavered in his praise for Tales of Tomorrow either. As, as late as you know, the late 80s, early 90s when I interviewed him, uh, I'll read you another quote. He said, quote, I owe a great deal to that show. It got me into the area that I've been working in. It was an absolutely wonderful experience. I was sorry when it went off the air. Some years ago, Mort Abrahams and I went to a seminar where we showed the window, and it was amazing how it stood up. And here she is looking out at the audience and saying that she has a feeling that someone's watching them. And of course, the audience at home watching this is, is really, this is an inclusive way to kind of bring them into this story as well. Uh, not to mention the people that got so worked up that they apparently called the police and asked the police to go look into whether uh, somebody might be about to get murdered somewhere in New York City. So I really do consider this just really brilliant television. Uh, Robert Lewin, uh, the fellow who insisted on the ads uh, that, that must air, he was a big part of this. He'd go on to work on countless programs. He even hosted the Emmy Awards in 1959 and 1962. Uh, he took part in six Emmy shows while serving as the first full-time president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. That was a position he held from 1961 to 1963, and again from 1970 through 1976. Uh, he went from ABC to NBC, where he was the head of programming in New York. And from there, he went to CBS and ultimately came out to Hollywood and ran their programming. Uh, from there, Robert Lean went on to Warner Brothers and uh, had a very stellar career. So as we wrap up, uh, I just really want to point out how brilliant uh, this episode is and, and how ahead of its time, too. So thank you, Frank DeFolita. Mr. Steiger, his performance we didn't get to talk much about, but was very good. Frank Maxwell, what little we saw from Virginia Vincent, did some very convincing drinking. So, uh, I do recommend this episode to people often when they ask me what they should, uh, you know, if they want to sample this episode, which one they should check out. And I always recommend this one. Hope you would do the same. So thanks for uh, joining me. I hope, uh, thanks for letting me in your ears. I hope you enjoyed this chat.